Okay. Welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, the aim of uh, this afternoon's meeting is to discuss um, various information that came out of a scientific conference known as the American Society of Hematology Conference in um, obviously held in, in the USA. Um, we may have time to touch on a couple of other topics at the end, but this will really depend on, on how much time we have left following the presentation. I hope you all find it really, really useful um, to listen to the presentation today. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Charlotte. I'm the Patient Advocacy Manager here at Leukemia Care, and we're holding this webinar jointly with the CLL Advocates Network. Thank you to them for promoting it for us. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that I'm joined by Dr. Piers Patton. Piers, could you just say who you are and where you work for me? Yeah, hi, thanks Charlotte very much. Um, yeah, I'm a consultant hematologist. I have a practice in London, basically at King's College Hospital and at Guy's Hospital, and I also work for King's College London. So Great, thank you. Me. So I think without further ado, we'll kick off the presentation. While Piers is loading his screen, just a, a reminder on um, how we'll take questions today. We won't be taking raised hands. I think there's a lot of you this afternoon and that would become unmanageable. So if we could uh, please use the chat function, which is the speech bubble at the bottom of the screen. Or um, if you're watching on Facebook, I'm more than happy to take comments. And um, from there, I have colleagues that are passing them over to me. Um, we will be also be stopping at, at period, periodically throughout the presentation to take comments on the particular section of the presentation that's just passed. So do try and sort of get your questions in in a timely fashion. But of course, if, if you don't, we can um, always come back to them at the end of the presentation as well. So um, without further ado, Piers, whenever you're ready, please do make a stop. If you are able to confirm for me that we're you're seeing my slides in full. Hang on, you're not yet. Are you seeing those now? I am, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay. That's that's brilliant. Let me just move that. So um I was asked to come to talk to you about key updates from the Ash 2021 meeting. Um Ash is probably the premier haematology meeting. Um, there are lots of other sub-meetings throughout the year and the Europeans have a, a meeting um, in the summer, but the American Society of Haematology meeting has always been seen to be the place where a lot of major updates happen. And so um, this happened both in person in Atlanta. I wasn't there in person, but I did attend the meeting virtually. Last year it was entirely virtual. Um, I think a lot of people were there virtually this year still. Right. So um, I've been asked just to highlight some of the main sort of trial findings from, from there, the new findings about CLL at ASH 2021. Um, I think in order to do that in a sensible way, I was going to quickly review the current treatments we have available for CLL um, in 2022. Um, but also discuss a bit about how we as, um, the, as the hospital or the medical team determine treatment responses. Um, and particularly looking at this term, which is either measurable or, or, or more commonly in trials, but is minimal residual disease, which is a concept for some of the treatments that people are on is very important. Um, so looking at therapies in 2022, I mean, I think, things have changed enormously. And if you look at this grid, I've put it into four columns. Um, and you'll notice that chemotherapy drugs I've greyed out, and that's very deliberate. Um, I personally haven't prescribed any of those drugs, Vladarabin, Bendamustin, Chloramacil, for a very long time now outside a clinical trial. And, and really actually COVID brought around their their complete disappearance in my practice, although I think they were disappearing anyway, but COVID suddenly brought it very rapidly to a close. Um, but I have been using a lot of BTK inhibitors, especially that drug called ibrutinib, and a lot of trials are still reporting on ibrutinib. Um, and then there are the new generations of these BTK inhibitors. Um, Acalabrutinib is now widely available as well. And there's another second generation agent called Xanabrutinib. 
And then you might start to hear more and more about so-called non-covalent BTK inhibitors. And that's the way they're buying. And we'll talk about that a bit when we look at the actual ASH data. And they've now got these names, pertabrutinib and nemtabrutinib, the two which were at the trial. So they're called LOXO305, and that's an MSK compound. Uh, often drugs are known by their, um, their sort of experimental name to start with before they then get a name like that. Um, there's the, I put BCL2 inhibitors. Um, there will be inhib more than one, but the one we're all familiar with and still really the only one we're using is venetoclax. And then we combine these drugs sometimes with monoclonal antibodies. So we always used to combine those with chemotherapy and that's where you get the acronyms like FCR, BR or chlorambucil or benetizumab. But we're still using those antibodies uh, usually in conjunction with venetoclax rather than with um, rather than with um, the inhibitors, the BTKIs. Um, so those are the drugs, and don't worry too much about the names just at the moment, because we'll come back to that um, when, when we talk about the, the data. So I, I often use these cartoons or try and explain things through them. I mean, what is a B, I mean, I, you come and see me and I say, I'm going to give you a BTK inhibitor, and you go, what on earth is that? Very simply, I hope you can see my arrow. Um, this is meant to be the surface of the, the CLL cell, which we all can count in the blood with your raised lymphocyte count. And that's got various markers and molecules on it, of which one is this B cell receptor. A CLL cell is a B cell. It's a type of white blood cell, a type of B lymphocyte. And this B cell receptor goes through a number of different molecules, one of which is BTK. And it's also associated with this thing called CD19, which we also target. So in order to keep any lymphos any B cell alive, but, and including CLL cells, they need to bind what we call antigen. Now, antigen is usually a, a, an infectious agent, such as a bacteria or a virus or, or a bit of fungus, or it can even be something from yourself. And all we mean by that is that the B cell receptor binds this protein, it's usually protein, but it can be anything else. And that gives the cell survival signals. And that actually is why B cells and CLL cells as well continue to live. And basically the principle of the BTK inhibitors, and here, and I can see in the chat, somebody's asked about covalent, but basically a BTKI, don't worry too much about the covalent bit, binds to BTK, BTK switches it off. And that switches off the survival signals to the cell. And actually what happens is that the CLL cell dies uh, due to a number of means. Once it gets pushed out of the tissues, like in, out of your lymph nodes, out of the bone marrow, out of the spleen and into the blood where it's not very well supported, so it dies. Uh, and, that, and that's really how these drugs work. And they, um, I think it was all a bit of a surprise. Now, really quite a long time ago when it was discovered how effective these drugs were in CLL. Venetoclax is another drug we use, it's a tablet. And again, don't worry too much about the details. This was just me trying to explain, but again, you've got a CLL cell. And, and again, it lives because um, that's, that's, that's what it does. Mitochondria are involved in, in metabolism in cells. And there's a whole complex pathway to make a cell either live or die, and it's called apoptosis. And this is mediated by a number of proteins and they're all called the BCL2 protein family. And BCL2 is a protein which stops cells dying. If there wasn't any BCL2, this thing called BAC would bind mitochondria and cause the cell to die. What venetoclax does is actually mimic this process and uh, it actually makes CLL cells die through natural process through this so-called apoptosis pathway. This that gives you death signals and the cell dies. And that's basically how venetoclax works. And then we also have antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, and we've all heard so much about monoclonal antibodies recently, but we've been using this drug called rituximab for ages in, in hematology, but we also use this drug called obinutizumab, and these bind a protein on the surface of the CLL cells called CD20, and actually their binding also kills the cell. So those are three things that we, we use quite a lot of. So using that, we 
then look at disease responses. So we decide that someone needs treatment. And I mean, there are lots of criteria for why people need treatment. And I wasn't going to particularly go over those today. Um, but when you look at a patient with CLL, they have CLL cells circulating in the blood, and that's why it's called leukemia. Or they're in their bone marrow, and there's, this is a picture of a bone marrow with lots of CLL cells in it. Or they're in patient's lymph nodes, and this is someone's uh, axilla or armpit. And if you look at that under the microscope, you get this pattern, and that's, that's what CLL looks like. And when we measure CLL disease, we look at it in the blood, and that's what when the doctor says, oh, your blood count's fine, you know, white count hasn't changed, your lymph site count hasn't changed, or it's gone up. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at CLLs in the blood. I don't look very much for CLL in a bone marrow, but I can do that by doing a bone marrow aspirate and trephine. I actually rarely do these, um, certainly not before treatment, but many people do, and you can find it there. And that's a bone marrow aspirate procedure, and trephine is for biopsy. And then you can look at it in the lymph nodes and spleen. You can't really look at it unless you biopsy. And again, not many biopsies will get done, but you can either feel that in the clinic. So I'll examine someone or I will organize a scan. And the typical scan in CLL that you should get is a CT scan. Some places do a PET scan. And I think there are only specific reasons to do that, but it's another scan that you might do. My email might be going off. So I'm gonna try and turn that off in a minute. Um, what I wanted to just talk about, because when we talk about the trials, we need to talk about how do patients respond if they get treatment. So um, we basically look at those three compartments of a disease and then we make an assessment. So we look at patients' blood tests after treatment. We might look at their bone marrow. In trials, people often look at bone marrows and we do scans. And these are to give us objective response. And essentially we're looking at three things possibly four. It's possible someone will progress in treatment. Although actually with the new CLL treatments, that very rarely happens straight, you know, straight away. People might progress later. But really all of the treatments we use today, I, I very rarely had a patient who hasn't actually responded at all, but uh, just at least initially. But someone can have stable disease, and that really means there's been not much of a change in their blood tests, not much change in their bone marrow find, uh, cells, and their CT scan, or it looks much the same. And, and that's what I mean there. Patients can have a partial response, and that means their white count perhaps has gone down, the CLL bulk in the blood's gone down, or their hemoglobin or their platelet count has improved, but it's not normal. A bone marrow also, you would get a reduction in the amount, but uh, there would be still quite a lot there. And you might find on a CT scan that the, the glands have shrunk, but they're still a little bit enlarged. Or we can get to something called complete response, and, that, and then I'd say, well, your blood count's normal now, or when I look in the bone marrow, I only see very little amount of CLL by using a microscope, certainly less than 30%. And if I did a, if I did a CT scan, the nodes are not enlarged, so they went, they're normal. So the radiologist would tell me it, they don't see enlarged glands. But there are two other categories which we need to think about when we look at our trial data today, and particularly when we're looking at certain types of treatment. And this is called either minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease. And again, we look at the blood and bone marrow. We cannot do these tests looking at lymph glands because we, all we can do is say we can't see them. We can't put a needle or a biopsy needle into them because it's just not possible to do. And so at the kind of microscopic level, I don't know if there's CLL cells in lymph nodes still because lymph nodes exist. If they're not enlarged, they're still there or in someone's spleen. But I can look at the blood and I can look at the bone marrow. And I can do something called flow cytometry and I can look at that. And if, if I sign some CLL cells there, I'll say there's measurable or minimal residual disease. And if we can't find any at all, we then say this patient hasn't got any measurable residual disease or often the term is MRD negative. To try and explain that a bit more, this is a picture of a blood, blood film. This is looking down the microscope before treatment, so I can see lots of CLL cells. And then after treatment, I don't see very many cells at all. In fact, these are normal cells, even though they look the same. We're pretty confident they're normal. And that's true of a bone marrow as well. You've got a bone marrow full of disease. And after treatment, looking down the microscope, can't see anything. Now, I can't tell just doing microscopy whether they've got MRD or not, 
but I can do flow cytometry. And if I can't detect it, I would say I can't really detect anything at all, or rather I actually ask the laboratories to do that. I look at the reports. I, I've, I've reported out these reports a lot in my life, but I don't do it personally. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the histopathologists or the pathologists will do the same. So just to summarize this section of the talk, and we might have a short break if anyone's got any questions. Um, I put here something called some generalizations because these responses I'm talking about are quite different if I've used the BTKI drugs or the ibrutinib like drugs, or if I've used venetoclax. And, and this is a generalization, and, and I, I, but often patients on BTKIs only achieve what we call a partial response. Um, and, and I'd say that's quite a common finding, but I'm still pretty happy that that's happened because I think that's a pretty good response to get. Whereas with the Nitoclax, we'll use the term partial, or quite often patients will have a complete response. More importantly, patients on BTKI are very, very rarely MRD negative or residual. They, we nearly always can find some CLL in the blood or in the bone marrow on patients who have been on a brutinib, let's say. But they will continue to have a really good response and be there, but I can nearly always find some CLL if I look for it. Whereas with venetoclax, and remember I'm only looking at the blood or bone marrow, often I don't find any, and patients on venetoclax are quite often MRD negative. And you might then go, well, hang on a minute, if the doctor says that there's less disease here than here, it's quite obvious that one's better than the other. But it isn't obvious at all, because when you look at actually how long a patient responds for or how quickly the disease might come back or when you might need another line of treatment. One would never really compare these two drugs head to head, as in one arm has one, one has the other. And then we look to see, and then those trials are ongoing, but we don't have results from them. And actually, I would just say anecdotally, I think, you know, I would say they're quite similar. So as a, as a, as a, as a physician or as a hematologist who uses these drugs, I, although these criteria that we define are quite different, actually in terms of practical outcome, in terms of how well a patient's doing, quality of life, carrying on about day-to-day, -day, or indeed having to start another line of treatment, I don't think we really know. And that is important when we come to consider different responses and when we look at data in CNL. Why don't we have a quick break there for any questions there, Charlotte, before we actually go on to the study? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the questions you picked up on already is what the non-covalent BTK is, but I'm assuming you're going to cover that in that, that, the ASH that section. Come, that will come later. Yeah. I think it's easier because I actually have a slide to explain that. Great. Um, okay. That makes sense. Um, the only one, the other one that's sort of specific to this portion of the presentation is there's a question about how the way you've described MRD, how the term um, MRDU or uh, being undetectable relates to that. Could you touch on that yeah. for me? So this is where it comes. Yeah, so all the, the U bit means un, undetectable. So I think I've, so I think the term MRD negative, UMRD are, are one and the same. What it means is we can't pick up any disease at all using the flow cytometry test. Um, so if you're, and that's where positive and negative also becomes difficult. So you just need to clarify it, but uh, undetectable or UMRD would be undetectable, minimal residual disease. Um, and as I say, some people swap the term minimal to measurable, and I've used the term measurable because I think it's slightly more understandable. But if you're, if yeah, so that's what. That makes sense, that, thank you. That makes sense. I think, um, that all that's all the questions we've got on this particular oh it's, it's like it, people know what I'm about to say uh, just as I was about to move on someone's asked whether what how clinically useful the MR, MRD is which I think you touched on at the end but did you did you want to say anything else on that topic so one of the reasons I've slightly labored this point is that quite a lot of the data at ASH which we're going to discuss we'll talk about minimal residual or measurable residual disease. And in fact, one of the major studies which were presented is the only piece of data they presented. And this is the problem. What, what does it mean? So what it does mean is that it, it traditionally, for patients who had 
chemoimmunotherapy, i.e. things like FCR or BR, if getting into a state of MRD negativity, i.e. what I mean by that, you couldn't detect any disease at all, definitely predicted for when a patient was likely to need more treatment or new treatments or, or relapse again. And that may also be true for studies using venetoclax because that is a state that venetoclax can achieve. Although we don't know that, but we're assuming in a way that's the case. But with the BTKIs, you don't necessarily get that. So it's not very useful for me to know whether a patient's MRD negative or positive if they've got them on ibrutinib because I know they're going to be positive, but it, it doesn't tell me much. So, so the answer is it partly depends what treatment you've got. The other thing is, at the moment, nobody is changing their treatment on the basis of getting an MRD positive or negative response. So it's not doesn't alter how a patient is subsequently managed. I'll have a slight caveat to that. But patients who achieve MRD negativity, let's say with venetoclax, I know it's, they are going to take longer to potentially relax than those who are positive. So I might be more inclined to say, well, I don't need to see you quite so often. And, and, and I think we're all learning about that. But generally people, generally I know my physician, my haematology colleagues, we generally don't look at MRDM and go, I'm going to see you on a certain pattern. But, it, but it's sort of, so I, I do often measure it but I only just sort of for my own sort of gauge, and I'll obviously discuss it with someone if I've done a test on someone, I discuss it with them, but it doesn't really change what I do. So is it useful? The answer is maybe. <laughs> Great, I think someone's then come back on, on your point about um, ibrutinib and asked if, you, if you're not using MRD as a way of deciding when to stop a BTK inhibitor, what does Okay, well, use, which a, we're getting quite detailed now, but yeah, um. that's an interesting question because, of course, the view is that you shouldn't stop BTK inhibitors unless a patient doesn't get on with them or, um, you know, they become intolerant or they become resistant. All the trials were done with continuous therapy, which doesn't stop. Now, we all know a lot of patients who do have to stop because they don't get on with them. I mean, they're, you know, the, the reason why and they don't have to go into another treatment. So, so those trials need to be done. Can we stop BTK inhibitors and then have a treatment holiday and not? It might be that the measurable residual disease level would guide us for that. So we might be able to say, well, you've got a high or low level of that. So we can quantitate how much we're measuring. So that might help. Or we could track it. We could say, well, I can detect some disease. I'm going to stop the drug and I'm going to restart it if it goes up. But all of these are really trial questions because we don't know. Now, I know everyone's now going to tell me that people are stopping BTK inhibitors because they've been, for instance, on the flare study and they've reached six years and they've stopped. And we've got a group of patients where that's happened because the patients who first were on that trial are doing that. And the answer is, I think after six years, it appears to be safe to stop the drug because we can always restart it. And no one's going to say we can't do that. If a disease was to come back, we'd be able to get of, we would be able to get hold of different CLL treatments, either venetoclax or perhaps a calibrutinib for that patient. So when flare started, we just had a brutinib and chemo. Now we have many more things. Uh, and the other thing is, I think we're all learning. And, and I think we do know, because patients have had to stop it earlier than that, that it is quite quite possible to stop. But actually, that's not what you're meant to do. You're meant, I mean, the trials were done with patients being continuously on it. That's the only real information we know. Great, thank you. I'm conscious we haven't got to the meat of the presentation yet, so I'll make <laughs> this the last question. Someone's asking whether um, your ability to achieve uh, minimal residual measurable residual disease um, is dependent in some way on the genetics of the CLL. So they've mentioned TP53 mutation in particular, but is, is, is the, the characteristics of the CLL disease matter? Okay, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, so patients who have TP53 mutations or deletions, and I often use the term TP53 disruption, generally have shorter responses to all of the treatments we have to date. 
uh, they, def they don't respond very well to chemotherapy, as we know, or rather they do respond, patients do respond, but they often relapse quite quickly. They appear to have a shorter response to BTK inhibitors than if they don't, if you didn't have that. And they tend to have shorter responses to the nutrient. This is consistently comes back as a finding. There's something about patients who've got the abnormalities in the TP53. But you could achieve MRD negativity. Um, it's just, I think you're less likely to compared to someone who didn't have a TP53 mutation. If you were to achieve MRD negativity, you might well have a very good response. You have to remember that when we talk about patients who have got one feature or another feature like immunoglobulin status and stuff like that, this is always looking at a large number of patients. And actually every individual patient can be different. And there are definitely patients there who've got TP53 abnormalities who do absolutely fine on one line of treatment, might get MRD negativity and might never need treatment again. Um, absolutely, it doesn't definitely mean that you're going to do that. It's just we know that if we were to take 100 people with TP53 abnormalities versus not, on the whole, there would be more people in that TP53 abnormality group who would need more lines of treatment than, than not. It's very, so, so again, when we look at trial data, like we're going to look, we have to remember we're looking at groups of patients and we're making generalizations. And in a way, it's all modeling. And I guess we've all learned about modeling <laughs> over the last two years as well. And um, sometimes the models are brilliant and sometimes they don't seem to be quite as good, particularly when you're talking about individuals. So that's my answer to that, I guess. Great, thank you. I think that um, is a good point to move on to our presentation. We've got a few other questions, but we'll come to those at the end, I think. So, um, ASH is a huge meeting. It's uh, typically has 20 to 30,000 people at it. I'm sure there were not that many this year, although there might have been as many online. Um, and it's busy. And I think Leukemia Care has already been doing lots of different presentations in different areas. And you find even if you just want to concentrate on one disease area, you find that sessions are in parallel. So, very, so this is a very... This is a very short view of what there was lots more about CLL at ASH, but these were the ones which were selected by the committees for being the most important or interesting studies. And they got a so-called oral presentation where people, where people um, actually present this uh, for, for 15 minutes or so. There are lots of posters at ASH as well, which can be absolutely fascinating. And there's some references to some posters here, um, and they often are associated with other things. And I thought what we should do is look at the FLARE study, and that's because I know a lot of people uh, will either be in on it or have heard about it, and that was reported for the first time. Not all of it, by any means. We've got loads more data to learn about FLARE, and, um, uh, um, but we've had the first look at that. I'm then going to quickly mention about talking about these so-called covalent BTKIs, and just bear with me on the, on the, on the wording, but covalent BTKIs are ibrutinib, Acalabritinib and this newer player, which is not yet licensed, but probably will come on soon, called Zanabritinib. There's a study then called the CLL13 study, which is a German study. And this is looking at venetoclax compared to a variety of things, including compared to FCR. And this is important because, um, as we probably all know, venetoclax in combination with bobinutuzumab is now available for all patients in England, at least, um, for uh, treating CLL in the front line. And we haven't actually had any data on that for patients who would, we would have, would have previously given the FCR regime to. Um, going back to all this about BTKI and venetoclax, increasingly we're trying to put the two together. We are looking at that in flare, but we don't know what the outcome is yet. But there was some studies looking at the com combination of the two. So um, I'll just give you a snapshot of that. And then finally, I'm going to touch on these so-called non-covalent BTKIs and what they might mean for people. So probably we'll go first of all to the FLARE study, which, as you know, is the, is the main UK study. And it got an oral presentation. And uh, we called it CLL10, but and that gets really confusing because um, the CLL13 I was talking about was from the Germans and, and they're not related at all. But in the UK, this is number 10 study called FLARE. And I've just put here um, 
a few of the things. So the study is looking at untreated patients who we call fit. I don't know about the terms fit and unfit, but fit basically means that um, patients in this study were less than 75, but I mean, obviously you can be fit if you're 80. Um, uh, but really what it means is that the patients who we thought that strong chemotherapy in the form of FCR was appropriate. And, and you can be 40 and not appropriate for strong chemo, and you can be 80 and you can be. So it's a bit of a, anyway, but that's what it's called. A lot of patients, I mean, it's a big study of this. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here is you've got to be less than 75. Now, we're unusual in the UK because we were happy to give FCR up to the age of 75, and actually loads of countries aren't prepared to do that, but we were. Uh, there's no point in debating it anymore because hopefully no one's being offered FCR really anymore. And what this means, it means the kidney's working. And then going back to this TP53, we knew before we did the study that giving FCR to patients with, with abnormalities of their P53 was, was not a good idea because it didn't work. So we took those patients out. And I think that was very sensible because we already knew those patients should get other drugs, for example, ibrutinib or indeed idilalacid when the study started. There are four arms to the study and mainly we were looking at FCR or these ibrutinib regimes. We actually started off by using it in conjunction with rituximab. And then this combination thing. Now, what's important to say is that all we have the data on from ASH is on these two arms. We know nothing about this arm and we know nothing about this arm. It's not that we, and, and genuinely we know nothing. Somebody knows, the data monitoring committee knows. And if something horrible was happening in these arms, the trial would be stopped. But the investigators, of which I'm one, do not know. And that's important that we don't know because otherwise that might influence how we manage the, the trial. Um, and this trial was looking at progression-free survival, which is the is how long does a patient after finishing treatment or uh, not need treatment again? No, it, 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 their disease isn't there. That's an important thing. Progression-free survival means can we detect CLL? Duration of um, time to next treatment is another useful measure, which is how long between um, finishing one treatment before starting another. But for this one, we were looking at progression-free survival or PF. And I put the recruitment slide up, which was the most recent one I could find, but it takes up to December 21. And you might all notice that recruitment drastically dropped off at this horrible date in March 2020. And uh, no one was recruited there. And then it started to pick up a bit again. Uh, and then it completely dropped off and it never really restarted again. And this is because as a community, we were very reluctant to treat anybody for a short period when COVID appeared. And then after it became clear that COVID really wasn't going away, and we all probably knew that, but um, we stopped, people stopped doing. So the trial's actually shut now, but it did pretty well recruit. It did actually, it got, got to where it should have been, um, but it did come to a slight premature close because of COVID. But we're, com we're confident we've got enough data to make, make, make a change. And it, it became clear by here because there are other trials that really we shouldn't be treating patients uh, with, with FCR. So the trial, apart from for high risk patients who are not gonna get FCR, the trial is shut. Uh, doesn't mean we're not, we're still obviously seeing the patients, we're obviously still carrying on. And this was the key data, which, and this is a so-called progression free survival. So this is a Captain Meyer plot, and this is the percentage of patients who have not progressed or have progression free survival. And so obviously at the beginning of the trial, nobody's not progressed. So 100% of the people aren't there. And as we go along, the curve, the curve falls off. And then there's this confidence interval, which means how sure are we that this is genuinely different, that the blue line is genuinely different from the red line or the purple line. Uh, it looks purplish to me. And as you can see, we start seeing some gaps here. So this means there's a statistically significant difference between these two curves. And the red line is the chemotherapy arm or the FCR arm. And the blue line is the patients who received a brutinib rituximab. And out of that, we've generated something called a hazard ratio. And we've put some statistics on that. But what this, uh, let's not worry too much about what 0.44 exactly means but it is to do with the, it actually means that the risk of um, getting, uh, not progressing is 40% less 
if you received a Britain versus versus FCR. But 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 don't worry. What we're seeing is a difference, and we start looking at these so-called median progression-free survival, which again is a horrible term, and it doesn't really translate very well when you're trying to explain it to an to somebody. But what this actually means is that five years, and it's just this is this is what it is. Uh, no, sorry, at, 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 at 66 months, which is actually uh, just over five years, five and a half years, 50% um, of patients who received FDR have progressed, whereas we don't know what that time is yet for those patients who received a brutinib, because we haven't reached the 50%, this curve hasn't reached 50%. So, I've deliberately gone over that quite because I think these curves are extremely complicated to understand if you don't really know what they mean. Um, what actually happens at meetings is that these things get flashed up and about 200 of them get flashed in front of your eyes and everyone sort of look. But the thing that people always look for is this statistic, <laughs> which proving something is statistically significant is not very meaningful if there isn't actually a genuine difference. So, uh, you know, a meaningful clinical difference is what I mean. It's, it, um, uh, and they tend to look there and, and you don't tend to look at the end of the curves because the number of patients involved here something get, you can see we only have six patients still here in this so we, we should always put the numbers of patients we have in there and it's so-called numbers at risk um, and this is what I mean by modeling this is actually still an approximation to what happens it isn't exactly what happens because each one of these lines is where the, the so-called patient is censored i.e. at this point, this patient progressed. We don't know anything more about them. And so the numbers that we're looking at get lower and lower and lower and lower, um, lower and lower. So at the end, and then these can sometimes have these sudden drops, we're actually looking at remarkably few patients. And it's very unlikely at this point that there's statistical difference because there just aren't enough people to compare. Comparing six patients to 11 patients is just not, just not enough. So, so you're really only looking at this bit of the curve, although we plot the whole thing, and this is a kaplan Meier plot. So why have I put these two curves to the right? Because these other bits of data suggested that actually this benefit was mainly for patients who had so-called IGHV unmutated disease, i.e. when we do your immunoglobulin mutational status, um, we, um, uh, and we do that and we, and, and we can talk about what that is if people don't know what I mean by that. Um, uh, but that was one of the things we looked at we know that those patients who've got unmutated do particularly well with the brutinib, or rather they do particularly badly with the FCR. But they're still doing well, by the way. I mean, if you've got FCR in this trial, you've still, you still done very well. And I think that's an important take home message. Whereas if you've got so-called mutated disease, actually your progression for survival is much the same, regardless of whether you've got FCR or the brutinib. Um, and we can discuss what that means as well. I still wouldn't give patients FCR. So rather than then showing you lots of other slides, because this presentation would have had about 20 slides in it, and there would have been tables, and there would have been tables of overall survival, which by the way, was not any different between the two things. I thought I'd just quickly summarize it, and I happen to know the data quite well, so I can tell you about it. But what we could say was that progression of CLL was reduced with ibrutinib compared to, um, I don't mean progression, I mean progression-free survival of CLL was reduced, i.e. there was a, a better progression-free survival. So uh, that is not good. I should have rewritten that sentence. And it was particularly significant for those with unmutated IGHV. Overall survival, however, was the same. And we think, as a bunch of investigators, that's because they're really good second-line treatments now for CLL. And so patients who progressed on FCR then went on to receive actually either a brutinib, which they would have possibly got on the trial, or they got this venetoclaxotoxamab regime. And we also noticed that the side effects were quite different. So we found that FCR had lots of infections, and there also were more deaths in the FCR arm due to this so-called secondary AML MDS. And that's a real worry with FCR. And that's one of the reasons I'm very unkeen on giving it. But we did see a problem with heart problems with ibrutinib. And, and anyone who's on ibrutinib, I'm sure, has been told, and certainly on this trial, that there's a risk of getting an irregular heart beat called atrial fibrillation or your blood pressure getting high. And we're now taking lots of steps to measure these. But there was also a little bit of concern that there was sudden death on 
on the Brutney Barn, which I mean, which is a very sort of uh, dramatic term, but it was patients who we think developed a heart rhythm problem and unfortunately, um, unfortunately died. Um, and, and I haven't shown you the numbers because I don't want to dwell on, I don't want to, the numbers here are very, very low. Um, Ibrutinib is a very, very good drug. It's very good at controlling CLL, but there was a concern about that. And, and, and I think the important thing is that we look carefully at patients who are on Ibrutinib, make sure we're controlling their blood pressure and doing that in conjunction with a GP and, and other th everything else. And, and I just think that's something that we all need to be aware of and it's out there in the public domain, so we should discuss it. So um, that is the FLARE study. Um, should we just quickly do the other studies and then talk about the ones with the other BTKs because they're quite similar, Sean, and then we can talk about that in general. Why don't we do that? Um, yep, that's and the nice. reason I'm doing this is because actually, um, and I, again, I've just put some a little bit of data here. Um, there were very similar trials presented using acalabrutinib, which is similar to abrutinib and zanabrutinib, compared to um, chemotherapy regimes. Um, the main ones being either bendamustine, rituximab, or obinutuzumab. Um, and, and, and what I will say is I think all these, and there are really quite a lot of studies now out there that suggest that using these drugs is more effective uh, than chemo immunotherapy. Uh, and flare is a really important one for the UK. Um, but um, there is some data comparing different types of BTKIs to each other. And there's data comparing acalabrutinib to abrutinib. This is a so-called Elevate study. And what that has shown is that acalabrutinib does appear in the study that looked at it, and it was a particular group of patients, to have lower rates of high blood pressure and irregular heartbeat. And that's encouraging. So we now have a drug which might not have the same heart side effects, or certainly not to the same extent as abrutinib. And that's probably also true for this drug called Zanabrutinib. So what seems to be, um, so what seems to be happening is that these so-called second generation um, um, BTKIs appear to be a little bit less, seems to have less of these heart side effects than Zanabrutinib. And so I think there is a general move now to use alternative BTKIs than Zanabrutinib. But if you're on ibrutinib now and you haven't got any of those problems, and I, I don't believe that you should switch from ibrutinib to the other ones yet. I don't think we've got the evidence that suggests that. And that's, I mean, so that, that's my own personal view. And, um, uh, um, but I think if I was initiating a new drug, I probably wouldn't use ibrutinib now. I would probably use acalabrutinib. Um, and if I thought you were having problems on ibrutinib, I probably would stop that. And then if I wanted to restart a BTKI, I would restart acalabrutinib. Um, and I think those are important sort of take home messages, which we've learned from this meeting, but, and this by the way is, I mean, we didn't learn, this isn't completely new for this year, but I mean, often with these clinical meetings, we just learn more and more each time. So why don't we have a quick break there if people want to ask about flare or all these other drugs using ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, zanabrutinib? Yeah, there's a, a bit a few questions. One is um, a bit uh, more if if we may have a little bit more on what IGHV is. Yeah. Um, you've already sort of explained its significance to response to treatment, but what it what it actually is um, is it? Yeah. I could have put a picture in, but I didn't. So the reason I'm going back is I'm going to show you this picture again. Ignore the bit about BTK. So there's this thing called the B cell receptor here, which is an, it's got lots of names. It's actually an antibody, um, which is very confusing, but it's bound to the cell. So it's therefore called the B cell receptor. And it's also known by the name as immunoglobulin. 
So as ever in medicine, you've got lots of different names for what's essentially the same thing. Anyway, the bit on the, the, the arm bits are the bits which bind the anti so-called antigen. And then this bit is that this, this bit's very, this bit's very um, what we call conserved, I, it's the same. But this bit obviously has to adapt and it has to, to actually has to mutate in order to bind the antigen. And the mutations that happen, um, happen in something called the variable gene. And this is part of our immune response. And that's actually how we respond to bacteria and viruses and stuff like that. Rather confusingly, in CLL, there are basically two types of disease. Some of these, there aren't any mutations in it at all. And, and that's what we call unmutated disease, or very, very low numbers of that. And in other patients, there's loads of mutations here. Now, normally people think, gosh, I've got mutations, that's bad news. But actually, these are, these are mutations we want, uh, not only for the disease, but just in general, we need mutations in order to be able to fight infection. And so if, if when we do sequencing or gene sequencing, he, looking at this particular part of the molecule, if there are lots of mutations, we say, ah, oh, they've got mutated immunoglobulins or mutated IGHV. And if there aren't any mutations, it's called unmutated. So you might say, why on earth did we do that? <laughs> and, and the answer is studies a very, very long time ago indicated that patients who didn't have any mutations here tend to have, to have more aggressive CLL. And that was just, they tended to need treatment earlier. They tended to respond less well to treatment. And that's true for patients who also receive, in terms of responding less well to treatment to chemotherapy. Um, and, um, and, and that, so that's why we look at it. So I, I hope that explains um, um, that, that explains that. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, somebody asked about, um, oh, there's been a follow-up question on that specifically, so I'll go to that next. Um, someone's asked why it's not always checked for um, in the UK. <laughs> I assume they're from the UK. Um, so until relatively recently, I think it made actually no difference to what you did about treatment. And I, I still think that's broadly the case. I, I, um, you, you know, you've got treatment options and it doesn't actually matter if in terms of what treatment you can offer. So it didn't make any difference to patients management. So I think not testing for it wasn't, you know, it meant they knew less about the CLL, but it wasn't necessary. Um, and that's still the case. You've still got access to all the drugs. Um, it also wasn't that widely available and, and there's a cost associated with the test. Now, today, because of the way that NHS has now been organized, actually, I think every hospital should have access to that test and, and it could be tested for. And I guess that's a conversation to have with that doctor as to whether it's helpful to know, is it something you want to know as a patient? Is it something the doctor wants to know and, and everything else? So I don't think it's wrong not to measure it, but in trials, it often is measured because it tells us more about disease. And I guess now we know that things like this, that patients who've got mutated CLL actually respond really nicely to chemotherapy. Um, you could say that is helpful except I'm now going to say I wouldn't give chemotherapy even to patients with mutated CLL. So, so the answer is, I, I can't answer why a particular doctor did or didn't test it. It's, it's, not, it's not mandated, it's not in guide. Our guidelines say you need to know someone's TP53 status, but we, we only recommend testing for mutational status. And that's what, we're, that's, what we're, that's what we think in the UK. That certainly makes sense to me in terms of if it's, you really need the information if you can do something with the information yeah. in some ways. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I was about to say before that question popped up that somebody did, did ask about uh, heart issues on a calibrated nib, but this slide, I think really covered that. Um, I yeah. think you, you did uh, say that the, the rates are lower. Um, the only other 
the other questions we've had are really about the features of the trial. So someone asked if FLAIR was only a trial that was done in, in the UK. Is that the case? It was. It was a what's a so-called academic study. So an awful lot of studies that we see presented today have actually been sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. And they're often international as well, i.e. many centres, because they've got more money than other, other people. Now, the drugs in FLAIR were provided for free by the relevant drug companies, but the study design and conception and delivery was sponsored by a university. In fact, it was the University of Leeds. It's always just one place it sponsors a study. And it was run by um, UK um, hospitals only. And the funding was that way. In fact, it, the funding is, is NHS funding. So it's effectively, it was an NHS funded study uh, in terms of running it. So very difficult to do that internationally. There were similar international studies running at the same time. The, the so-called ECOG study um, from the US is actually very, very similar. And we already know the results of that a bit more than Flair. It's slightly differently designed and things like that. So it's definitely an international comparator in terms of it's got international standing, but it was a UK only study. Great, thank you. Um, someone did ask earlier about stopping the combination of venetoclax and ibrutinib, which I don't think is um, specifically relevant to this, but I don't want to leave their question out. Um, so if you are on a combination of treatments, I guess, talking more generally, is there a preferred yeah. way to stop a treatment? You yeah. did talk about stopping ibrutinib, for example, so maybe we can sort of link it with that so it, might, it might be better to do that when we look at the combination studies later on. Um, right. They're all designed a bit differently, just to really confuse everybody, including <laughs> me. Um, but Flair has got this stopping rule in it, and actually that's all based around MRD, but that wasn't particularly looked at yet. But some people on the study will be stopping, and you, you potentially you could stop ibrutinib if you became MRD negative, so it happens, but actually so few people did, it's very rare. Right, okay, I think I'm sure you'll cover the rest of that. <laughs> Someone's asked a question that I was um, thinking, although uh, they put it slightly more bluntly <laughs> than I would, um, in terms of what is the value of continuing to compare things to FCR if it's becoming more and more, um, but less and less used, I suppose, is a better way of saying it. Well, I think you shouldn't use FCR, but I happen to know that it's still being prescribed out there. So um, I think it supports the evidence that we shouldn't use chemo immunotherapy um, for, for in a number of ways, although you could argue that you could use it for patients with mutated CLL because they did exactly the same in terms of progression-free survival. Um, I think that's always going to be a problem with a, a disease such as CLL that some of the treatments become um, perhaps unfashionable or out of date by the time we go. But I think it confirms that we're making improvements. We can look back and look at other studies and compare that way. Flair has still very much got other arms it's looking at. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a very useful study, but obviously what we'd love to know is the results of all this immediately. But the whole point of doing a study is to show that one treatment is better than another. And you're always going to then say, well, if we're not going to use the other treatment, then what was the point of doing it? It just happens that there are a lot of studies out there coming out at the same time. So, so I think it is still a very useful study. I, I, I can see the point of the question. But <laughs> I was thinking of um, talking about in terms of value of comparing, but someone yeah, just much more <laughs> to the point than, than I was. Thank you for that comment. Um, I think that's all the questions we have specifically on these studies um, and in the interest of time yeah just to move on. Better move on so here is a study called the CLL 13 study which also had FCR in it now this study didn't have any UK centers in it actually but I think we were and that's because we were all doing another study um, but this is a German study so <laughs> This looked at FCR or BR, actually, Bendamustin and Tuxman, and looked at venetoclax or venetuzumab, a regime of venetoclax or tuxman, but not the one that we're all now familiar with, or this so-called triplet combination, which was venetoclax, ibrutinib, and obinutuzumab together. 
which is quite potent, actually. Um, and this was looking in patients who were fit enough for FCR or BR. So whilst we had data on venetoclax or venetuzumab versus patients receiving chlorambucil regime, we haven't seen any data to know whether venetoclax or venetuzumab is better than FCR or BR in so-called younger, fitter patients. So that's what it, right. So I think that's what I said at the top. So when you do a study, you, you have a so-called primary endpoint and that's how a, a study is designed. And, it, and, and you can have lots of other endpoints, but the main one is the primary endpoint. And the reason I was slightly laboring about the minimal or measurable residual disease is that this was the only endpoint which was reported at ASH. And in this study, they looked at the blood and bone marrow patients who there. Progression of CLL, which I think is probably a more important marker, is not yet reported. So we just don't know still about progression. And in this particular study, all the treatments lasted 12 months with the Um, The FCR treatment was only six months. And then they had a look at the disease three months after finishing treatment, so at the 15 month time point. And I just tried to put a schematic together. I tried to simplify the graph which was produced. And essentially this thing called CIT is the FCR and BR arm. And then this VR regime is venetoclax rituximab. And this is the percentage of patients on the left who had no detectable disease in the blood using that flow cytometry test I talked about. So those patients who received either FCR or BR, 52% of them had no disease detectable in the blood. Whereas those who had VR, only 57%, not very many more. And when you did your statistics, there was no difference between the two. So this kind of VR, and the reason I say this kind of VR, ER, because it was this is rituximab with the nitoclax. It was only given for 12 months, not two years, 12 months. There was no difference. Whereas those regimes which used obinutuzumab, this other antibody to rituximab, so this is the nitoclax obinutuzumab, they did a lot better in terms of the amount of minimal residual disease, which was not there. 87% of patients, or 86.5%, had no detectable disease in the blood at 15 months. And this triplet regime, where you use all three drugs together, was a bit better, but again, actually no difference between the two. So if you were sort of looking at this in terms of this particular outcome, i.e. 15 months late after starting the treatment, it was the use of obinutuzumab in combination with venetoclax, which made the difference, not yeah, now, of course, what they didn't have was an arm which had FCO, for instance. So we don't really know if it was the obinutuzumab or the venetoclax, which made the difference. And so, so this is a slight, it's quite difficult to know how to, to interpret this data in some ways. But what we, what we can say is that this is the first time that we know that VO, i.e. venetoclax with obinutuzumab, is better than in terms of develop, get, getting this deep response is better than either FCR or BR. So all those patients who are getting this without any data before, we now have a little bit of data. There was quite a lot more on the study. I think this is very, very early days. Um, this, is what, this is what the same conclusion as I just stated. Well, I will say, generally, they tell us that the treatment was well tolerated. There weren't any side effects, which people really worried about. Nearly everybody completed all the treatments, which is always a good sign because, um, you know, you might say, I'm going to give this treatment, and then if half the patients don't actually have it, or only have half of it, it's very difficult to know. There's a problem, isn't there? They stated that all the patients who got the triplet combination, all three drugs together, had the most side effects. Well, that's, in a way, not that surprising. Throw in another drug to a treatment regime, it's probably going to have more side effects, so... That doesn't surprise me. And, and I don't think that triplet regime is very easy to give, actually, because um, I, I, I'm a, uh, so, so I think I can see, I'm not surprised that happened. I think the main key message is that we're going to um, 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 learn more about this study later this year. So I suppose the important message about that is that for the first time we've actually seen some data which is better uh, that shows that this venetoclax obinutuzumab, which is available on the NHS, in terms of whether we can detect disease in the blood at 15 months, is looking better. 
So I think in a way that's good because I think there's been a move to do that anyway. So it's nice to have some data to back it up. And really we've got lots more to learn about the study and I'm absolutely convinced it will be presented every six months and we'll learn something new about it every six months because that's what happens when we study. Um, but that was the first look. The, uh, the secondary endpoint, which is the progression free survival has not been met yet. And what that means is that there weren't enough incidents of people progressing for us to be told. So, and that's the problem with CLL studies. You have to remember all these treatments are pretty good. Even FCR is, you know, and patients do really well on it. I can see that there are some concerns in the chat. I can see that. And, uh, um, but, you know, so, so that's a message about CLL 13. That's probably a little quick to break again. So why don't we just quickly look at the studies combining venita claps with ibrutinib. And the first slide I actually lifted from the presentation of this GLOW study, um, but I've, I've written some hopefully slightly simpler text um, in its place, but the pictures I thought were quite good. And the argument being, why would you want to put ibrutinib and venetoclax together? And the reason is that, and that's what I was saying at the beginning, ibrutinib, actually, if you've got these, C these lymph nodes full of CLL cells, we know that ibrutinib pushes those out into the blood. And, and it appears that venetoclax is very effective, particularly in the blood and the bone marrow. So pushing the cells away from the lymph nodes out of the blood might be really helpful in the combination. Ibrutinib and venetoclax work together so they actually um, there's data out there to suggest that they kill better together rather than each on their own and they also both just directly work well on the on the cells so so there's a good sort of what we call a preclinical rationale to um to combine the two and to before we do it and i think there are lots of studies looking at this combination and flare is one of them but we've also looked at them before in something called Clarity, and some of you may well have been on the Clarity study. Uh, it was a small study looking at this combination in relapsed patients, which has been previously reported. And I just want to say one point. In this GLOW study, which uh, was reported at ASH, they made this point that all the disease compartments, including the lymph nodes, were, were responded really well. Well, that's not very surprising. But and this might be rather difficult to explain, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, when we look at a patient, going back to the first thing I said, we look at the blood, we look at the bone marrow, and we look at the lymph nodes. So, and we've been talking about whether the disease is measurable in the blood and bone marrow. What they said in this study, and, and I'm not that surprised by the findings, but uh, and, because I think this is, the, if patients who had detectable disease still are in green and those who didn't and this is in the blood and bone marrow are in yellow and what we saw was that even patients where you could detect blood uh, disease in the blood and bone marrow on the combination of the britain and venetoclax over time their lymph nodes never got bigger even though they had detectable disease in the blood whereas patients on chlorambucil or benetizumab this chemo a lot of them didn't have any detectable disease in the blood and bone, but, but their, their lymph nodes started to grow again. And that means that all our talk about MRD may not really be telling us about what's going on in the lymph nodes, because these yellow patients here were progressing, even though it appeared that they'd got MRD negativity. Um, obviously, the blood started to show it at this point as well. But my point being that being MRD positive on this regime might actually be better than being MRD negative on this regime. And, and what, what I'm really trying to say is that a test which is good, a test in one treatment condition might not have the same meaning as in a different one. And, and that's where it gets really confusing and difficult to understand. So I may not, that's quite, that's quite a difficult concept to explain. I may not, have uh, may not have done it, but that's what I was trying to do on that particular slide. <laughs> um, so we can either finish off and then just do questions right at the end. Maybe we'll do that because um, there's just a little bit more I want to talk about. And then we can, um, uh, and, uh, and I can see there's some burning questions in non-ash areas, but we'll see about that. Finally, come on to this thing I keep talking about, which is non-covalent BTKIs and just to confuse everyone's terminology. So 
Covalent simply means that something binds permanently, whereas non-covalent means that it, it actually can bind them and it can come off again. So it's just terminology. But the covalent BTKIs bind to this BTKI on a particular part of the um, on, the, on a particular part of the molecule called 481. And this can mutate. And, and this is just something which happens in evolutionary terms. Um, anything which is exposed to something will often, you know, there'll be selection pressure for it. And, and, the, and, and if there's a mutation on the binding side, uh, and that's called BTK481, um, then these drugs stop working. And, and that's a problem uh, with those drugs. And, Going back to my original picture, which we went over again, here's our covalent BTKI bounded to BTKI. But if BTK mutates to this so-called C481, these stop working. And you become resistant, and um, that's something we can actually test for now in the lab. These so-called non-covalent BTKIs, and this is these drugs called pertobrutinib or nemptobrutinib, can bind that. And they and and the, and then they have the same effect. So this is a new class of drug, which can actually bind to this mutated BTK, and work away. So you so you might have someone might have disease which is resistant to ibrutinib, let's say, but then it turns out they're not resistant to this new drug. And I think this is actually my final sort of what we might call data slide. Another Kaplan-Meier plot. Uh, the numbers. Are down here, not that many patients, but 80 in each group, which then diminishes. And what because these lines are overlapping, or near enough overlapping, and they cross here, but they look pretty much the same. What this is telling us is that these drugs work just as well in patients who have the mutated form of the PTK versus those that don't. And so that's quite interesting data because this means it's another new class of BTK which might be really useful for patients who um, are unable to take ibrutinib or acalabrutinib because of resistance, or because they get side effects. And there are ongoing studies, which again look in both conditions. And, and really the message from those studies was um, that these two drugs, pertobrutinib and nemptobrutinib, appear effective in CLL, even with patients who have received up to five previous lots of treatment. So that's quite a lot of treatment. Now, I suggest that these patients might have been around for a quite long time and had several lines of chemotherapy because it's rare these days to find patients who've had that many lines of treatment with the newer drugs because they tend to work a bit better. The other important thing is the side effects were similar and they're being looked at in, when, when I say upfront settings, they're being looked at in all the different settings for CLL. So to summarize the presentation slides, and um, I mean, that's just a small snapshot, really, of what was at ASH, um, but quite a lot to, to, to you know. And I think the key message is for me, in terms of what we can say today, is that chemo immunotherapies should really be going. Um, I think we're learning much more about how to use these drugs in combinations, and there are continuing development in new drugs. There wasn't very much on some of the very new sort of technologies, and I know that there's been a lot in the press recently about things like CAR T therapy and other such things. Actually, for CLL, we have been learning about CAR T therapy, but we didn't really learn about it at this ash. That doesn't mean that it's gone away or it's not being developed. It just meant that the there wasn't a new update rather than it's gone away completely. So there wasn't anything new to say about it. I think those studies are probably still ongoing. They are a bit small and CLL hasn't had quite the uh, same impact in the CAR T field than other diseases. And, and that I actually think should be an encouraging sign because it actually means that the drugs which we do have are working pretty well. And I think that's one of the reasons for that. There have been some other issues with CAR T and CLL, but, uh, um, but I think that, you know, those will still be coming along. They're just taking a little bit longer. Uh, and weren't really talked about at ASH. Right, that's all my slides, so I'm going to get rid of them. Um, Thank we'll, you. Stop sharing. Yeah, I might try and turn my email off, which has been going on. <laughs> Just to um, 
the first I've got a, quite a general question that maybe applies to all of the treatments that you've talked about um obviously one of the things that, that the patients I talk to a lot as well as, as this person asking the question do worry about is the damage to the bone marrow of chemoimmunotherapy by having a new therapy are you sort of guaranteed that that's no longer a problem or is it just a smaller risk or is there no difference yes good question so um, the answer is that the damage to the bone marrow, and it's usually the single myelodysplastic syndrome, is something that's just recognised to happen after chemo. And we have not been seeing the same rates of MDS in the non -chemo, in the non chemo. So so even in Flare and in the other studies with FCR, there are a few cases of MDS, and they are nearly all happening in the FCR arm and not in the other arm. So at the moment, we don't think that MDS is a feature of the other ones, but you can never say never. And it's still relatively early days. I mean, chemo immunotherapy has been around, or philodarabin has been around for a very long time, as indeed has all the other chemo. So we just know a lot more about it because we, you know, we've got 20 year, 25 year follow-up data on FCR. Maybe 25, not quite, but 20 year follow-up data. And we just don't have that with the other drugs. So, yes, we are looking or we'll observe that it will get noted in terms of, um, uh, um, so we don't think so. Um, one of the things every study always looks at is the incidence of other cancers, because it's just one of those things we do in studies is to look for other cancers. And we don't think that excess risk of other cancers on the newer drugs. It's always difficult in CLL because we all know that CLL can have a slightly higher incidence of other cancers anyway. Great, thank you. Um, I want to go back to the, uh, the side where you talked about the difference between <laughs> disease in the lymph node and disease in, um, in the blood in terms of yeah. negative MRD. And I wondered if you had any thoughts as to why that might be happening. I was having visions when you were talking of cells hiding in lymph nodes, <laughs> but maybe yeah. I've got the wrong picture in my head. No, I don't think you do. I think we still don't know where the main, main was sort of where what I would call the main action in CLL is happening in terms of, um, I think what happens in the lymph nodes is quite different to what's going on in the blood. And, and the bone marrow might be a sort of mix of the two. Um, and I think it's very possible that cells are sort of hiding. There might even be a stem, but this is, this, is, this is sort of fantasy in terms of we just don't know, but there might even be a CLL stem cell somewhere. Probably isn't in the blood. It's probably sitting somewhere in the lymph node. So, so that might be why. I think going to the slide as to why there's a difference, I think if Brutlin is really good at pushing out those cells from the, bone, from the lymph node, um, now, whether it pushes out that possible that stem cell, I don't know. There may not be a stem cell, so, and then people are going to ask me what stem cells are, so I probably shouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> but um, um, that would be sort of what I'm thinking. But I, I, I do find the combination of the BCR inhibitor and the BCL2 inhibitor attractive, because one, we know people get on with it well, and two, um, they're sort of working slightly differently, so working, therefore working together will be more likely to keep the disease away. And I, I, I think that will probably be, the, but I mean, this again, I'm not really allowed, that will probably be the outcome of all these studies with that, those combination arms. So we won't necessarily have to be having this debate about should I go on one or the other because you get both. Don't hold me to that and I didn't say it. <laughs> Well, I think my next question will be quite tough as well, because I was thinking, uh, I hear often from the uh, CLL patients that they're thinking one treatment ahead. Um, they're thinking what's next as well. So if you're having two good treatments at the same time, what happens if they don't work? And is that a concern from the clinician side as well, when you're thinking about the potential in the future of being able to use both ibrutinib and venetoclax? Or do you feel you've got enough in the toolbox, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, I mean, this, this goes to the sequencing idea, um, which is something which comes up a lot, and we have a lot of debates about it. Um, I, I, I guess I've got two thoughts on that. My advice would be don't overthink it, um, because I think then one can overly worry about it. 
perhaps unnecessary because all the treatments are very effective and there are more things coming along. But equally, if I said that, then you would go, well, doctor, you don't care about me and you haven't thought about it. And, and so I have thought about it quite hard. Um, and certainly when I meet a patient, talk to them, think about what I'm going to do, I, I make a lot of assessments. And, and one of the things that goes through my mind, I don't often ex necessarily say this, but is how many, and, I'm, and I now say, how many decades am I going to be treating this patient? Or, they, or am, am I going to have retired when they're still on CLL treatment? So, um, and, and getting that right. So if I use everything at once, have I burnt all my bridges? Well, what we're trying to do with these combinations is to stop treatment. So Flair has a so-called stopping rule and many of the combination trials is only for a couple of years anyway. And um, my view on that therefore means that if we stop the combination because we think the response is good enough and we then have a time off it, there's no real reason why we can't use the same drugs again if the disease was to come back. So I don't think we should say I'm not going to use the combination because otherwise I won't have anything to treat with them to treat when, because I think actually, if I can more effectively treat treatment uh, disease right up front, then that usually results in a better outcome. I and mean, that's just a general premise. Use your best treatments first. It's, it doesn't make much sense in medicine to use an inferior treatment and then use a better one. And that's often a problem with a lot of these studies is that often patients who are, who are being studied, and I know that's a horrible term, but you know, the patients are patients who've relapsed from all standard treatments. And I think that's, that's reasonable. If I'm using a treatment that I don't know very much about, it would be extraordinary for me to then suggest giving that rather than a treatment I know works really well. Yeah. But when we're trying to maximize responses and use drugs which we're very familiar with anyway, it might be that it makes sense to use a combination before a single drug, because we're very familiar now with ibrutinib and its cousins, and we're very familiar with venetoclax. So we, we sort of know what kind of responses we get with those drugs. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to use those in an upfront setting as a combination. Great, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's just a, a warning to everyone listening. This is the final question I can see on the topic of ASH. So if you did have any more questions on the things that um, Chris has presented, now is your final chance to ask them. My question is around the CLL13 trial. So in the UK, we currently um, can use venetoclax and venetuzumab, um, but it's only been approved for a, a period of time on the Cancer Drugs Fund um, in new patients, um, in, in patients that are having their first treatment who would otherwise have FCR. Do you think this CLL13 trial, it looks promising enough to you to make a, a stronger case for, for it to become more widely available when it's when, when the decision is looked at again in two years or three years' time? It's that venetoclax or venetuzumab particularly? Yes. Uh, yes, I do. I mean, I think it's supportive. I'm sure by the time we get to that in two years, we'll know more about the progression for it anyway. I, I, think I think they must think they're almost there because they were fairly confident they're going to tell us about it in the summer. Uh, no, I think that's very, I think, I mean, with all the caveat, um, because, you know, it's just a very slight glimpse at it. But I mean, it's certainly showing us it's very likely to be more effective. And so I think that will be strong supporting evidence. And indeed, I think all credit to um, NICE and, and, and everything, they anticipated that and they didn't demand to wait to see the data before they, and they very, you know, and it was put on the so-called CDF as opposed to the baseline commissioning because they couldn't really baseline commission it on no evidence. But but I think actually all credit to 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 um, the NHS England for doing that because they could see where it was coming and going. And uh, rather than, you know, we have to be pragmatic. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's good. Someone's flagged to me that um, I did miss their question, which I think is a bit of a clarification about some of the things you were saying about hypertension earlier yeah. and what to do um, if you were on ibrutinib and you develop hypertension, what, what would you normally do in terms of a calibrutinib? Would you, would you just switch someone over straight away? I think you did touch on that, but maybe they... they I, 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 would actually, I would manage the high blood pressure in the first instance, because I think that's important. I think if that was uncontrolled or uh, not simple, then I think you might wonder if you could switch to another 
BTKI, but it should be possible to manage the blood pressure. I can see a very specific question about ACE inhibitors. There was a concern um, that there, and, and all I can say about that is that it appears for patients who were having the problems, some of the heart problems uh, that were seen, and, and we have to remember numbers extremely low, did seem to be on ACE inhibitors. Um, and, and, and those people seem to be much more likely to get this sudden death rather than not. Does that mean ACE inhibitors cause was the, the combination which is a problem? I don't know. I think, just think it's something to be aware of. So the trial is advised coming off ACE inhibitors if you're on ibrutinib. The company has not, and nor have the regulatory authorities, and they don't think the evidence is strong enough from this trial to do that. And, and I think, indeed, if you ask the trial committee, is yet yeah, they're just saying in this trial we have sufficient concern, but they're only looking at that trial. And they're not looking at everybody. So um, it, it's a tricky one because it's not actually regulatory advised that you should come off ACE inhibitors, but that's what's been what's been done. I think just measure. I think just get the blood pressure controlled, <laughs> which we should have been doing anyway. Great, thank you. Well, a couple more questions have popped up. Um, do you have any um, suggestions on how to manage joint pain that comes from ibrutinib? That's a funny one, the joint pains, because they often happens quite late, um, I find. If, uh, it, often, it often goes, but not always. And it often responds to analgesia of some form or other. But again, that doesn't go... I think if it's become an intractable problem, I would strongly look at how long we've been on the ACE and, uh, on the BTKI. Is there an alternative BTKI, or could you come off it? I've often I've seen it in some patients really quite late on, and actually they've been in a position to be able to stop it. Um, if it's a side effect of that medication and it can't be managed with you know relatively simple measures, there's probably not much else we can do other than either reduce the dose. And then there's always a bit of concern about that um, or try an alternative drug. Great. Hopefully that And helpful. someone's asked about overlapping side effects. Uh, the answer is some of them are overlapping and others are not. So headache seems to be very much a feature of acalabrutinib. Heart problems does seem to be more abrutinib based. Easy bruising and easy bleeding seems to be common. So I think it depends on the nature of the side effect. And one of the advantages we have is that we have a completely different class of drug that we can use. So, so that's something that's need, needed. Someone's asked, um, you, you've mentioned quite a lot about stopping ibrutinib today in the context of a trial and, and things, but someone said they were told they would never be able to stop ibrutinib um, unless they had side effects. Um, when they first went on it and they just wanted a, a bit of clarification on why that was the case. <laughs> I don't know in what context that remark was made, so it's very difficult for me to comment individually. Um, as a general rule in medicine, I never use the word, <laughs> but I try to, I mean, I think, I think never is a, a difficult word to use in medicine, and one which should probably be avoided. Well, I think I could understand the, the context of a remark is, but there's no data to support stopping it. <laughs> but if you stop it, because that's a, a mutual decision you make, as long as you and your doctor are in agreement about that and you understand the implications of stopping it and whether you can access it again or not, or what may then happen, clearly you can stop it. No one can force you to take a drug. So you can never say never in that way because clearly you can stop it. But I think you would need to be informed that that is not, we don't have data to support that. But someone might have designed a trial where you stopped it after four years and then we would know that result and then we, could, then we would be able to tell you. Um, but clearly in real life, you can stop it. <laughs> it's just not recommended. Yeah, right, I think that should hopefully clarify um, for the person that's listening. Um, while my um, colleague is um, preparing our 
closing slides. We've had a few questions on COVID and I appreciate that's not all we invited you to talk about, Piers. So I, I welcome you to say as little or as much as you like, but I wondered if you had any thoughts to share. People have asked, for example, about um, whether we know any more about vaccine responses in CLL patients and um, I've also asked whether they should continue shielding. Did you have any comments you wanted to make or please feel free to, to say no? So COVID has been with us for two years now and we've had several waves of the infection and at the beginning no one really knew how to respond as we saw by the different responses throughout the world. We now know a lot more, but we still, as ever, don't know as much as we would all like. We have all learned, and I mean, some of us knew that there are several aspects to the immune response, and most of the vaccine responses have really only been looking at one aspect of the immunity, which is the antibody. And we don't know so much about the T cell responses. We've also learned that in terms of the general population, that even several vaccine doses don't, doesn't seem to stop transmission of the disease in the way that perhaps other vaccines in different areas might. We've learned that you can use treatments such as steroids, antivirals, monoclonal antibodies, and we've got all of that. And we also have to judge whether as the virus changes, if it's more or less severe, and that's also very difficult to do now. So those are all the things we've learned in general. In patients with CLL, we always knew that immune responses in CLL could be a bit different from other people. It's a disease of the immune system and that infections in CLL are common, whether you're on treatment or not. We also know that it's safe to give vaccines to patients with CLL. And we also know that clearly patients who've been vaccinated in CLL, regardless of whether they've had antibodies or not, either don't seem to get COVID when everyone else in their family does, because I've seen many patients like that, or seem to get an, an, an illness not dissimilar to other. And then we've had other patients with very severe illness. So all I can say today, and this is when someone comes to clinic, and I have this, I have this conversation a lot, is that there's a risk out there. There is a risk that people, you know, that may or may not be more for patients with, I mean, I think it is a little bit more for patients with CLL and, that, and COVID. And we can try and optimize things in terms of delivering, if you need treatment, delivering it in a, in a COVID safe way, choosing treatment regimes or tailoring them that they're like that. We can, we can be confident that we have access to antivirals and monoclonals and things like that. And we can discuss how we could minimize exposure to the virus. But things have always been, you know, there have always been risks out there. And it's really, you sort of got to reflect on that and your own individual risk assessment as to what you're comfortable with and, and what you're doing. But I think we've learned so much. There's lots we can do. And I think that's the way I would approach it. You may not find that a very helpful answer, but those are my thoughts. And I'm sure we could talk about COVID for two hours and that's not because it's not an important topic. No, absolutely. Just conscious I didn't want to put you on, on the spot to, to give uh, any more detail today. But thank you for those words. I hope people find that reassuring, especially those in the UK who've um, maybe been worried by some recent um, news coverage. Um, and um, if you are still concerned, please do get in touch and we'll do whatever we can at Leukemia Care to, to help you out. Thank you, Piers, for, for that and for, for the talk prior. Um, it's been a really interesting afternoon. I'm just going to close the, the session with a few slides with a bit more info on what we can do, Leukemia Care, to help. Um, we'll uh, shortly, hopefully in the next few weeks, be announcing the rest of the, the webinars we've got planned for the, for, for the year. So um, do look out for those. And we also do podcasts and have a magazine in the meantime to keep yourself up to date. So please do check those out. Next slide, please. Um, 
the booklets are particularly useful for basic factual information about um, CLL. So uh, we recently revamped our, our CLL one actually. So do check those out, if, especially if, if you're newly diagnosed or moving on to a particular stage, for example, going into treatment and things, you'll probably find them particularly useful uh, at those stages. So um, you can find those on our website in our new uh, online shop. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick slide summarising our support service. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, our next national support group meetings where you can meet other patients uh, and often ask questions of a clinician much more directly than, than in this sort of setting uh, where you must do it through chat. Um, the next couple of ones we have coming up for CLL are in April for a general meeting of all CLL patients or if you're, particularly, if you're affected by watch and wait in particular, um, or on active monitoring, if you prefer that term, um, we're holding a meeting in May. So do check out, uh, check those out. Next slide, please. And just to say our advocacy caseworker is a particularly useful service for um, understanding more about um, how treatment decisions are made and um, how you can or should be involved in those decisions. Um, if you're struggling to come to terms with a lot of information, um, we have a special person just to sort of help talk you all through it. So please do make use of that service um, if you need it. Next slide, please. A couple of fundraising opportunities. Um, we've got we've just relaunched our step out for spot leukemia challenge for March. So this is a really good fundraising opportunity. If um, some other fundraisers can seem a little daunting, you can set your own goal um, that, that's perfect for you. So um, do check that out if you're interested. Next slide, please. Or if you're a bit more adventurous, um, which is not for me, really. <laughs> the London Landmarks Half Marathon is coming up in April. Um, if you're looking for a, a really big New Year goal, um, please do sign up for that one. Next slide, please. All the ways you can get in touch with us online if you are a social media user. Next slide, please. And um, contact details of both us at Leukemia Care and also with the CLL Advocates Network if you are joining us from... Um, another country today. Thanks again, Piers, for a genuinely really interesting presentation. Um, as you can see from, from the comments coming through, I think people have really appreciated um, your thoughts on what's new in CLL. Um, and hopefully see you all again shortly. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thanks.